Hello everyone, and welcome to my General Hospital official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Drew Cordemain on General Hospital has experienced a turbulent life. At first, he thought he was Jason Morgan, his twin brother, thanks to a crazy memory mapping study that the villainous Helena Cassidine started. Despite the fact that he never completely recovered his memory, he succeeded in life. With the exception of brief relationships with Elizabeth Weber and Sam McCall, who mistakenly thought he was Jason, he hasn't had many real relationships. He also had a brief relationship with Kim Nero before her grief over the death of their son Oscar Nero from cancer caused her to experience severe mental illness. He was in a relationship with Carly Spencer, but when Jason, who was thought to be dead, returned to Port Charles, Drew decided to end things since he knew Jason would always be her priority. He deserves a true, long-lasting romance right now. After Carly and Drew were reported to the SEC by Nina Reeves for insider trading, he was sentenced to prison after the whole thing went haywire. After being freed, all he could think to Nina was hate and anger. They had hate sex after months of verbally abusing one other, he was her employer at Crimson Magazine. They have since been able to put their past grudges aside and come to appreciate one other's positive traits. Every now and then, there's still a little friction, especially after he kissed her married daughter Willow Corinthos. However, Nina is now supporting him in his bid to run for U.S. Congress. She believed that in order to project a similar picture to voters, his opponent, a family man, would need her by his side. They have an odd kind of chemistry and might work out even though they aren't formally a couple. Corinthos Willow it appears that Drew has developed feelings for every lady he has come into contact with lately. The three of them are frequently together because Michael Corinthos is his nephew and resides in the Quartermain Gatehouse with his wife Willow. Drew was a member of the group of Port Charles heroes who prevented the end of the world when Victor Cassidine intended to release a deadly virus that would have eliminated the majority of humankind. In order for Dr. Liesel Albrecht to develop an antipathogen for him and the few people he was concealing, Victor kept her prisoner. Liesel was Willow's only match for a bone marrow donor at the time, and Willow was near death from leukemia. Thus, Liesel returned to Port Charles in time to save Willow's life after Drew and his group foiled Victor's scheme. That strengthened their bond, as Willow was moved by his bravery. After Drew declared his campaign for the House of Representatives on July 4, he and Willow kissed in a moment of exhilaration. They ended up kissing again on the August 30th episode, and Willow told Sasha Corbin that she's beginning to feel something for him even though they were telling each other it was an isolated incident. Willow's marriage to Michael will probably terminate if the truth is revealed, freeing her up to date Drew. She is his niece-in-law, which has many fans upset, therefore it's unknown if a relationship between them would last. Drew looks fondly at Deputy Mayor Jordan Ashford every time he sees her. Though it appears like General Hospital is pressuring Kate in the direction of newbie Isaiah Gannon, the two clearly click. Although it would be interesting to see Jordan and Drew together in a scene, they first need to see what the audience think of them. Jordan and Brick have incredible connection, thus a love quadrangle may be in Jordan's future. Fans of General Hospital are currently being treated to a simple murder case that is full of you moments and some real brain teasers. First of all, why, a few days after the murder, is a crime scene suddenly being used for recreation? Not only did James almost drown this summer at the Quartermain Boathouse, but Sonny also shot John in the spot with deadly intent. Sasha hosted a nice brunch for Cody and his new family a few days ago. Willow used the space for her morning yoga practice the following day. Given how recent the murder was, shouldn't there still be police tape and a chalk outline of a body? Who would want to work out and have a meal in the same location where an unarmed man was just shot? That's even if the police completed their investigation in record speed. At the end of the week, Lois brought up the fact that the boathouse remained a crime scene, but she failed to provide an explanation for why people were enjoying themselves at the scene of the crime. Regarding the individual who shot an unarmed man, it appears that Sonny has lost all self-awareness at this point. We are also expected to feel sorry for him and wish that he is not apprehended. We witnessed Sonny brutally shoot John. Even though John wasn't a particularly likable person by the time Sonny shot him, that didn't mean he wasn't someone who should have died. 
When Sonny promises that Alexis won't spend the rest of his life in prison but still won't confess, are we expected to view him as a hero? Is it appropriate to give him credit for hiring Marty to represent Alexis in this matter, given that he took her regular attorney's clientele? When Michael and Sonny became close because Michael decided to assist Sonny in hiding his crime without flinching, were we meant to utter the word awe? Given that Michael attempted to imprison his father, a criminal, for more than a year, is that really expected to make sense? At this moment, Sonny's only chance to save himself is if he comes clean. Rather, it deflates to hear Sonny say that Christina ought to be aware that her father is supporting her mother. By letting the police know that he killed John, Sonny could be there for his daughter's mother and let Alexis to go free. Maybe Christina inherited Sonny's lack of self-awareness. Once again, she ignored Molly's feelings in favor of her own during the week. It doesn't matter that she keeps calling the child she was carrying for Molly and TJ Adela. Even though Christina is aware that the infant's legal name is Irene, she doesn't seem to care. As Molly noted, TJ also lost his biological child, and Christina hadn't even inquired about his well-being at that point. But let's go back to the boathouse, er, murder scene. Willow worked out in the same area where a guy had just been shot to death, and she was there with congressional candidate Drew. We even had the standard scene of the damsel in distress falling on her own two feet and landing in the arms of a waiting lover. Regretfully, Drew is growing more and more eerie as he almost always approaches Willow on the quartermain grounds without a shirt on. Drew simply follows Willow as she attempts to flee if he spots her in public, such as at the Savoy. The ick factor between Willow and Drew is practically unstoppable, as Drew appears to have no qualms about kissing Willow and having a sexual relationship with her mother, Nina. Merely an additional day in the American politician's life? While Alexis Rose on Schitt's Creek may not be making songs about herself, Alexis does currently have many murders on her record. With Heather Weber as her cellmate, Alexis is back in the cell while her family members get into a knot over how to clear her name. Though it defies logic that a serial killer would be housed in a general population facility, we'll overlook this for the inevitable comedic relief. When Sonny discovered Rick was Ava's attorney, he went up to confront him. Danny informed Elizabeth that Lucky will be found by Jason. In court, Alexis intended to defend herself. Molly had told the police that Christina had no alibi for the night of Kate's murder, which caused Christina and Molly to dispute. Cody was first shown a comatose Lulu by Dante. Stella pleaded with Trina to go back to school. When Sasha revealed to Willow that she had witnessed Willow kissing Drew, Willow said that they had done it twice. Until the trial, Alexis was detained to Pentonville without being granted bail. After Heather's blood test, Rick informed her that she didn't genuinely have cobalt poisoning. I will find the rifle that Alexis threw into the river, Sam vowed. Elizabeth instructed Rick to have a lab outside of GH examine Heather's blood once more. Martin was hired by Sonny to defend Alexis. Heather turned revealed to be Alexis's cellmate. Elizabeth assured Rick that she only desired friendship. Dante permitted Rocco to see Lulu. Cyrus visited Isaiah, who was a transplant physician, as it turned out. Jason played cards at Sidwell's table when Anna and he arrived to the club where Sidwell and Holly were. To duplicate Sidwell's phone, Anna took it. A battered Lucky saw Elizabeth in his vision. Ned informed Lois that he didn't like her new accent and threatened to fire Valentine from ELQ. Drew extended an offer to Curtis to become Aurora's temporary CEO. Once Sidwell extended an invitation to Jason and Anna to return to his camp, Anna and Holly helped Jason win the card game. Ned and Michael were fighting at one other at the Quartermain mansion when Lois stepped in. That Ned had sided with Valentine infuriated Michael. Michael was concerned that Valentine would begin liquidating his shares to fund his fugitive lifestyle. Ned retorted that Michael would still be alive if he hadn't allowed Sonny inside the house. Ned claimed to have instructed the ELQ attorney to get in touch with the SEC in order to halt any ELQ stock trades. They could all agree, according to Lois, that they wanted ELQ to keep expanding. Willow recommended to Michael that they spend the evening together. Lois proposed mediating a ceasefire between Ned and Sonny. Sonny will always be a part of Ned's life, she added, as Michael's father, and she wondered why he felt the need to harbor such strong animosity. 
As Lois pointed out, Ned had pushed everyone away but Sonny while he believed he was Eddie Main, and Sonny had been kind to him throughout that period. Geo came in as Lois was telling Ned that she would consider a truce worthwhile even if it only resulted in a little peaceful time. She suggested that he attempt to make it happen. Ned angrily remarked that he couldn't believe anything Lois said since she had given up her accent when they first met. Ned stated the truth was often unpleasant, but Geo thought it was overly harsh. When they were by themselves, Geo told Lois that he didn't mind her accent but that he missed Aunt Lois's voice. Despite his stress, Ned was a kind man, according to Lois. Geo took issue with Ned's conversation with Lois. He questioned Ned's hatred of Sonny. There was too much tainted history, according to Lois. Geo expressed his disapproval of Sonny's reputation, while Lois countered that Sonny possessed positive attributes as well. According to Lois, Sonny was a trustworthy, kind, and devoted friend. Geo said that he had also heard negative things about Ned. He may not admit it, but he and Sonny have a lot in common. Lois remarked, those two are more alike than either of them is willing to admit. Curtis told Portia at the Savoy that although he had been busy at business lately, he had plans for the family and that Aurora would cover the cost. Portia claimed to have heard rumors about the Quartermains at the hospital. Curtis concurred that while they were decent people in their own right, their group fights were legendary. Curtis should prepare an escape route, just in case, Portia suggested. When Nina and Drew showed up at the club, Portia questioned their decision to go out together. Drew drew Curtis aside and told him the campaign required all of his focus. In the event that Drew won the election, he intended to make Curtis' role as interim CEO permanent. Portia inquired of Nina about Drew's situation in the meantime. Nina clarified that she was merely keeping Drew company and assisting with his campaign, but that Drew needed to be seen out and about. Nina claimed that because Drew had saved Willow's life and the congressman had praised him, she regarded Drew in a different light. When Michael and Willow arrived, Neca inquired if they would prefer to eat with their family or at their own table. Peering about, they observed Portia and Curtis being talked to by Nina and Drew. They went over to the bar with Nina. Willow questioned Nina's absence from Drew. Nina clarified that she was backing Drew's candidacy and that he had requested her to keep him company. After apologizing, Nina headed to the bathroom. She requested Neca to tell Michael in the hallway that she was feeling sick and that she would be calling a car service to come get her. Drew approached and offered to forward the message. When Willow was by herself, she informed Drew that she was aware he had asked Nina to go with him on the last push of the campaign. Drew claimed that even with everyone around him, he occasionally felt lonely. Drew reported that he witnessed Willow running away from him any time she saw him. Willow claimed that in order to get away from their problems, she had persuaded Michael to go out with her. And here I am, declared Drew. Drew resisted Willow's desire to go, telling her that they couldn't alternate between scuttling away every time they saw each other. It will highlight an issue that is unfounded. Nothing has ever happened between the two of us and never will. Not at all, remarked Drew. While in the bar, Nina informed Michael that she had suggested to Drew that Aurora appoint an acting CEO for the remainder of the campaign, and that Michael would be a prime candidate. When Willow came back, Nina inquired about her well-being. Nina wondered if Willow was unhappy about seeing Drew. Willow remarked, it's nothing, nothing at all. Michael announced to Drew that he was prepared to take over as Aurora's acting CEO. Drew claimed to have asked Curtis already. Michael was informed by Drew that ELQ required his full attention. Michael related his altercation with Ned to Drew. Michael was assured by Drew that they will work together to restart the family enterprises. Holly saw Anna using Sidwell's phone in the casino. Holly declared that she would set off the alarms. Anna clarified that she required Holly's assistance in swapping out Sidwell's phone. It's for Luke, said Anna. She informed Holly that they needed to locate Lucky since Lulu required a transplant. Anna was somewhat aback when Holly revealed that Holly had seen Lucky the day before. Holly informed Anna that Lucky was imprisoned at Sidwell's camp as a henchman for Sidwell was listening in. Sidwell, according to Holly, changed the passwords every day. It makes no difference how talented you and Jason are. 
you have no chance of entering and leaving unnoticed, Holly remarked. Jason, meanwhile, continued to lose poker hands. Sidwell declared that he was done playing and that he wanted to depart with his girlfriend and pocket his winnings. Jason revealed that the woman seated beside him was hiding something. He declared that Sidwell was having an affair. Thanks for watching if you like this video, so please don't forget to subscribe my channel and don't miss any update.